mode. Good afternoon and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientist monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation and your host and moderator for today's webinar. I'd like to wish everyone a very happy and healthy New Year and thank you for joining us for our first presentation in 2015. Today, Dr. Kerry Ressler will present updates on the science behind PTSD. The Brain and Behavior Research, Research Foundation funds research around the world that identifies the causes, improves treatments, and ultimately will result in preventative techniques and cures for mental illness. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $320 million in research grants. We are the largest funder of mental health grants outside of the federal government. And what makes us unique is that 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in the grants given directly to our researchers. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Kerry Ressler. Dr. Ressler is an investigator for the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Emory University. Dr. Ressler received a bachelor's degree in molecular biology at MIT and received an MD and PhD from Harvard Medical School. He was the recipient of our NARSAD Young Investigator Grants in 2002 and 2005. He also received the Friedman Prize for exceptional clinical research by a young investigator in 2009. And he's a member of the Foundation's Scientific Council. The Council identifies the most promising research ideas to fund with Foundation grants. Today's webinar will start with Dr. Ressler's presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel on your screen. You can submit your questions th throughout the presentation. As your moderator, I'll present your questions to Dr. Ressler and we'll address as many of them as possible in the time allotted. And now I'm pleased to present Dr. Kerry Ressler. Kerry, the stage is yours. Thanks so much, Dr. Borenstein. It's really a pleasure to be here. Happy New Year, everybody, and I'm delighted to um, present um, the first talk of the year for the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation focusing on post-traumatic stress disorder. My talk today will begin with an overview of the diagnosis of PTSD, some of the clinical findings, and the primary, some of the primary hypotheses underlying PTSD, as well as briefly some of the treatment approaches. And then about two-thirds of the talk, I will focus on new approaches focusing on our understanding of the neuroscience and the molecular biology and the genetics of PTSD that we hope will lead to the next generation of treatments and interventions. So post-traumatic stress disorder is considered a pathological fear reaction is one way of thinking about it. And again, I'm going to just by way of, um, of, of statement, I'll be talking about post-traumatic stress disorder primarily from a perspective of fear, but it's very important and I'll try to talk about it as much as possible. There are many other ways of thinking about it, both in terms of stress and shame and guilt and cognitive functioning. But the primary aspects that we're making, I think, the most rapid progress in understanding neurobiologically is fear, and so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. It affects about 5 to 10 percent of the population and about 20 percent, uh, up to 20 percent of veterans, depending on the, the um, level of trauma exposure. There are several different criteria. The first, of course, is that the person has experienced or been exposed to death, threatened death, actual violence. And characteristic symptoms include intrusive symptoms, including re-experiencing of the traumatic event, nightmares and flashbacks, avoidance symptoms, avoidance of the trauma, and, and associated cues and triggers negative alterations in cognition and mood, decreased interest. This used to be called uh, combined. C and D were previously combined in DSM-4 as avoidance and numbing, and this is really one of the critical differences in the DSM-5 categorization of PTSD is a separation of these two clusters of symptoms. And then finally, um, increased arousal, the idea of decreased sleep, startle, hypervigilance, irritability, etc. Um, and so the sets of symptoms that 
most of the data I'll be talking about today will probably have the most to do with the intrusive symptoms, avoidance, and increased arousal. So certainly some of the hippocampal and prefrontal work I'll talk about probably has to do with decreased cognition and decreased concentration as well. Again, um, a number of epidemiological studies have suggested that PTSD occurs in about 8% of the population, though in highly traumatized populations such as military cohorts or highly traumatized inner city populations, which is our primary research cohort, um, we can see it as high as 25 or 30% of the population. And there are numerous risk factors that have been identified psychologically in terms of childhood trauma, childhood neglect, pre-existing and comorbid anxiety and depression, other psychiatric disorders. And also, as with many of the mood and anxiety disorders, is about a two to one female to male preponderance. And it's often preceded by acute stress disorder, which is really the first month of symptoms. But as we'll talk about, many people, and most people, the vast majority in fact, do recover over the course of the first few months after trauma. And who develops PTSD and the differences between those who develop PTSD and those who don't is one of the critical questions. So again, the central issue in the field and one of the most um, thought about so research problems is why do some people recover and others not, given that trauma is um, a universal experience. And I'll be talking about two primary theories. One, overlearning of trauma memory. So how at the time or in the sh aftermath of trauma are these initial fear memories that we'll be talking about over incorporated in the first place. And then secondly, we'll be talking about the idea of failure to extinguish. And extinction we'll talk quite a bit about, but it's the idea of the creation of new inhibition of fear, that one is no longer afraid after continually re-exposing oneself to the cue of, um, of being exposed. And so I'll define extinction a bit more, but we think most importantly that extinction is both a natural process that occurs over time after fear development, but also one for which is directly targeted by one of our best understood therapies, which is exposure-based psychotherapy. And um, work done by Barbara Rothbaum, um, really seminal work a couple decades ago now, really suggested that PTSD, again, develops um, PTSD-like symptoms are almost universal in the first hours and even few days after trauma. These period feelings of numbness after severe trauma, whether it be a, a gunshot or a car accident or a, interpersonal violence or a rape, um, and that people can be overwhelmed and may, will take a number of days or even weeks to recover. But over time, the vast majority recover. What she found was that if you do a retrospective analysis and look 12 months out, those who have gone on to develop chronic PTSD, though they, there was no significant difference at the initial assessment, they maintained their level of fear and stress response, whereas those who recovered and were, went on to not develop PTSD recovered normally o over the course of weeks to months so that they had very few, if any, symptoms by the end of that period. And again, one of the critical questions is what's the difference between these two? And one of the leading theories is that PTSD is in part a failure to extinguish or naturally inhibit a, a normal a fear memory after its early development. There's a number of treatment approaches, and I'll, I'll hit on them briefly throughout the course of the talk today, but um, just, in, just in terms of broad swaths. Um, benzodiazepines have a lot of, um, there's a fair amount of controversy about when is it appropriate or not to use benzodiazepines such as clonopin and Xanax um, and the like. With, generally, as with uh, most anxiety disorders and anxiety comorbid with depression, we find that benzodiazepines are most useful in the short period of time as long as there's a longer term treatment plan that is being activated. For example, starting an SSRI, starting mood stabilizers and bipolar disorder, in other cases where benzodiazepines are used in a very um, careful way and tapered relatively quickly. What we find using benzodiazepines long term is that they seem to, at least in some studies, suggest that there may even be a worsening of extinction or an impairment of the psychotherapeutic benefits of exposure therapy. So more is needed to be understood about the role of benzodiazepines really in the best way to use them. Certainly the only two FDA approved treatments for PTSD are um, paroxetine and sertraline, SSRIs, and they increase a number of the um, improvement in a number of areas, certainly the comorbid depression as well as tolerance to aversion, to some extent decreased stress and fear response, um, yet they people are often left with a lot of hyperarousal symptoms and avoidance and other symptoms. So of course most people um, respond to a combination of both medications as well as exposure therapy. And there are a number of exposure therapies, but the one that has, I think, the most empirical evidence and for which I'll be talking the most about today is exposure-based psychotherapy, and prolonged exposure therapy is one version of that. <laughs> 
So where I want to really go today is talking about the progress that is in, has been made over the last decade or two and is um, very rapidly being made in understanding the neuroscience of post-traumatic stress disorder. And there are several reasons why I think PTSD is a particularly tractable disorder from the perspective of psychiatric illness. One is that PTSD shares a neural circuitry of fear that is very consistent across mammals, and we'll go through that, but I think it's more so than almost any disorder in psychiatry, we can really understand the circuits in a way we can't in many other cases. Number two, we know when it starts. The time of the trauma, by definition, is the time of the beginning of PTSD, and that gives us enormous power both in understanding the mechanisms of how post-traumatic stress develops and how one recovers or doesn't from it, but it also gives us a lot of hope in terms of impeding the development of PTSD in the first place. And as I talk through some data later on, the last story I'll tell is one of, several, of using several different approaches from a bench to bedside translational approach to understand ways to impair the consolidation of memory formation and potential new future ways of having treatments that one could give either in the emergency room or on the battlefield to prevent PTSD from ever developing in the first place. And finally, PTSD shares um, this component of learning and memory, and, and one could argue that progress in neuroscience um, in the area of learning and memory is one of the areas of, of most um, exciting progress over the last couple of decades. So the goal um, for many in the field then is to really develop a molecular neurobiology of PTSD combined with predictive biomarkers, novel interventions both to prevent PTSD as well as novel interventions potentially combining medications with psychotherapy to make the therapy work in a more targeted, specific, and profound way to treat ongoing, existing, and chronic PTSD. So we'll start with the concept of fear. And this is a classic diagram from Joe Ledoux. And what it reminds us is that um, often um, we'll be walking, say, through a park or in, in the forest and be having a nice, pleasant day. And then all of a sudden, um, I, I particularly notice this when I'm going to walk in the evening with my wife. She'll start um, jumping up and down and screaming because she sees a snake. And I'm like, what's going on? What's going on? And she says, oh, I'm sorry. It was just a stick. And, <laughs> and, we, and, and when, when many of us go through that experience, we can realize that all of us have this prime system to be able to prepare ourselves for, for survival. And um, what happens in that case is even with a relatively minor um, thing like a stick, one can activate this whole fight or flight system with changes in heart rate, blood pressure, um, really preparing for survival. And as Joe Ledoux called, talked about it early on, he talked about the low road versus the high road. And so you can see in this diagram, the idea is that the eyes see this snake-like figure, which may in fact be a, a stick, but this primitive visual figure activates the amygdala through thalamic relays much faster than the, than the many other synapses required to go through visual cortex, associative cortex, et cetera. And so before one has a chance to process the information, the amygdala has already activated the hardwired fear response. But what happens in a modern day world is that we're constantly barraged by cues of trauma, of, um, of threats. Um, we're seeing the whole world's traumas lay out before us on 24-7 news every day. Um, and in PTSD, obviously one has, can have extraordinarily um, experience of trauma. And in these cases, we end up with situations where our fear system is often doing more harm than good. So there are a number of different circuits that are involved, and I'll spend most of the talk talking about the amygdala and its hardwired fear outputs related to the direct fear response or fear reflex. But it's important that we pay attention or at least know that there are other areas involved, particularly the prefrontal cortex, the medial prefrontal cortex, which is particularly involved in inhibiting the amygdala activation, the anterior cingulate, which different parts of it are involved in both inhibiting and exciting it, and particularly the hippocampus and the parahippocampal gyrus, which together provide the context um, and the pattern separation important for fear and fear modulation. And again, one thing that is so often seen with post-traumatic stress disorder is that those who have PTSD are more likely to generalize fear cues and to not be able um, to separate what's fearful and what's not, what's a trigger and what's not. Well, interestingly, one of the um, areas of research that's had the most early development was in the, in the area of hippocampus. And um, Doug Bremner, originally, previously at Yale and then at Emory in the VA, um, did a lot of their seminal work in the 90s on this area. And he and a number of others went on to show across multiple studies that in people with PTSD, they seem to have, using structural MRI, smaller hippocampal volumes than those who do not have PTSD. And in fact, in um, 
in combat-related PTSD, they were able to show bilaterally, but particularly on the right side, smaller hippocampal volume relative to those who had trauma but did not develop PTSD. And again, this suggested that something about the size of the hippocampus, possibly through its role in regulating sensory information or pattern separation, may be one of the risk factors for those who may go on to develop PTSD versus those who are resilient or who are extinguished normally. One of the most interesting components of this study, um, again, by Eric Vermetten, Doug Bremer, and others, suggested that this may be, in at least some people, reversible. That's that those who had chronic PTSD um, but were treated for one year with variable dose paroxetine or Paxil um, had both uh, um, improvements in their PTSD scores. CAPS is the clinician administered PTSD scale. It's one of the gold standards in the field. But also, most interestingly, they had recovery or increased hippocampal volume with paroxetine treatment in PTSD. And about a decade ago, a lot of focus was being put on what is it about hippocampal size and volume, and that, that seemed to max out and slow down a little bit. But more recently, there's been some really interesting data on the hippocampal um, volume in humans um, possibly being related to, um, to um, differential neurogenesis. And Renee Hinn's group um, has some particularly interesting data that um, reduced neurogenesis, which is comes downstream with stress, um, cortisol, um, mineral oil, or cortical activation, a number of things for which many groups have studied over a couple decades, may be involved in um, the impaired contextual processing and pattern separation that um, seen in PTSD, such that um, that antidepressant treatment, enriched environment, psychotherapy may in part be involved in enhancing hip enhancing hippocampal function, and together that may serve as a counterbalance to provide greater discrimination for threatening versus non-threatening cues. And so how the role of the hippocampus in regulating the sensory information is integrated with the amygdala in sort of activating the fear process is one that's an area of great active research and is quite interesting. So what about the amygdala? Um, so the amygdala is, again, the area that's most associated with fear. It's located bilaterally within the temporal lobes, about two inches inside of the ears on both sides. And if any of us are watch, look, were to look at a screen and, um, and see a fearful face, um, these are the um, classic Ekman faces, a fearful cue versus a neutral cue, we get some level of activation of amygdala with fMRI. Um, what a group at Stanford, particularly Amit Etkin, has shown in a number of different studies is that a number of different disorders, particularly post-traumatic stress, social anxiety, and specific phobia, can all be characterized in part by this intermediate phenotype of amygdala hyperactivation. And so this is coming back to the idea of overactive um, amygdala and fear responses being one of the critical and cardinal intermediate symptoms of PTSD. More recent work, this by Jenny Stevens in our group, has shown, um, again, fearful faces being associated with increased PTSD symptoms overall, and particularly with avoidance and hyperarousal symptoms. And yet we did not see this as the same relationship in traumatized control. So something about the PTSD subjects um, was associated with much more amygdala um, Q-related hyperactivation compared to people who had experienced similar trauma but did not have PTSD. How do we study the amygdala? How do we start to make sense of what's going on at a cellular and molecular level? And this comes back to one of the reasons why I think PTSD is particularly tractable. Data over and over again has suggested that the human amygdala is not that different than the rodent amygdala. And the processes going on with fear learning, fear activation, and extinction learning can be quite similar across the species. And the classic way um, many, really hundreds of labs around the world now study Pavlovian fear conditioning is we'll take a rat or a mouse and we'll um, pair a different cue, a tone or an odor or a light with a brief foot shock. You do that a handful of times and then you bring the, back, the animal back the next day or the next week or the next month and the animal shows a, fear, a specific and very reproducible fear response. And what is thought is that the tone is activating a set of sensory structures in the thalamus the unconditioned stimulus is also activating a set of pain and aversive um, sensory structures. But those together are meeting within the amygdala, and that's where the synaptic plasticity is taking place and learning occurs, so that now future tone alone events, even without any shocks, are able by themselves to activate these hardwired symptoms of freezing, changes in blood pressure, hormones, and other physiological responses. And I think the concept of a panic attack is one of the best ways to understand what the symptom clusters are 
behind a lot of these hyperarousal components of PTSD. When someone has a panic attack, they may say something like, all of a sudden I felt dizzy, my legs gave out on me, I couldn't catch my breath, it felt like someone was choking me, I could feel my heart was beating too fast. When panic attacks are associated with this whole cluster of symptoms, increased heart rate, chills and hot flashes, stomach upset, shortness of breath, pulmonary changes, choking sensation, lightheadedness, sweating, chest, and then this cognitive interpretation of these symptoms, really this fear of dying or losing control. We can really think of a panic attack as a fear attack, in effect. It's essentially this fear reflex being activated. And what's different across these fear-related disorders is really what triggers the fear. So with um, PTSD, again, it's being triggered by, this panic attack is being triggered by the specific cues that remind one of the trauma that one experienced um, in combat or in the assault. In social phobia, the cues are often related, um, of course, to interpersonal um, experience and to personal cues. Simple phobias, if you're afraid of a spider and a spider lands on you, you have all of these symptoms, you just call it being scared to death. But it's the same fear reflex. And with panic disorder, interestingly, it seems to be fear of fear itself. People might have a panic attack after an initial period of stress or trauma or depression. But then they associate the symptoms, they associate the symptoms with um, with the bodily response and with these panic responses. And they don't have the conscious association, it seems, that the first panic attack occurred at this time of trauma. And instead, they start worrying about, well, is it going to happen again? I don't know what's going to, when it's going to happen. When I start sweating, maybe I'm going to have one. When I start having trouble breathing, maybe I'm going to have one. When my stomach's upset. And that then leads to the cycle of panic attacks. The reason I go through all of this is that the um, decades of work in the amygdala neurobiology has shown that hardwired the hardwired connections from the central amygdala lead um, to all of the symptoms of panic attack. The heart rate changes, the bradycardia, the panting, the startle, the freezing, the corticosteroid, HPA axis stress response. So these brainstem and subcortical regions together activate all of this hardwired fear response. And again, more so than anywhere else in psychiatry, I think we have a specific behavioral reflex that we know a specific brain region activates it. And we can then back the question up to not why do we have these fear res responses, we know that, but why do some people have them and other people don't? Why do some people recover from fear and other people don't? So the last part of the talk, I'm going to walk through several models of, of new data for how we think about what's going on between those who go on to develop PTSD versus those who recover. And we're going to talk about differences with pre-existing sensitivity, and we know that about 30 to 40 percent of those who develop PTSD have genetic, that about 30 to 40 percent of that risk is genetically mediated via, because of um, twin studies. We also know that a history of child abuse and childhood trauma, for example, puts one at a higher risk. We know that different levels of tr trauma exposure leads to higher levels of PTSD. We know that after a trauma, um, it is consolidated in different ways in different people, and that may lead to differential PTSD recovery. And then after the fears expressed and, PT and the symptoms are chronic, those who develop PTSD go on to generalize these sensations. They sense are more likely to sensitize the fear, whereas those who recover are more likely to discriminate context, what are good context and bad, safe cues versus dangerous, and they are more likely to extinguish. So I'm going to tell a couple stories, one on differentially understanding risk, some on understanding how we can enhance the extinction of fear. Again, if we talked about that early study from the Rothbaum lab showing natural extinction occurs in those who recover, but those who don't recover and have PTSD have an apparent deficit in extinction. And how can we combine the neurobiology of understanding extinction of fear with the natural processes of extinction that occur with exposure-based psychotherapy to target enhanced emotional learning? And finally, how might this understanding of fear learning and consolidation lead to new approaches to prevent fear formation in the first place? How on the battlefield or in the emergency room could we prevent it from ever developing? So there have been a number of studies, and one of the best understood is, is the FKBP5 protein. And this um, is a protein that is involved in glucocorticoid receptor regulation. This is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal stress axis. And Elizabeth Bender's group at the Max Planck has been particularly active in understanding this process. And the point that I want to make here is um, one of their studies um, from about um, five years ago showed that different versions of the FKBP5 gene by itself did not predict PTSD. 
But if we looked at rates of child abuse and incidents of physical, sexual, and emotional child abuse, and this was done by Elizabeth Fender, Beck Bradley, um, and a number of others with the Grady Trauma Project, we found that increasing rates of child abuse was associated with increased PTSD symptoms. But as you then divided all of the population across one version of the FKBP5 gene that was associated with more glucocorticoid sensitivity versus another version of the gene that was associated with less glucocorticoid sensitivity, as people had higher levels of child abuse, they had much different responses to that abuse and to adult trauma, again suggesting that different genetic mediators of how one responds physically to stress leads to different interactions of how the environmental stress early during development may affect the amygdala sensitization later during adulthood when an adult trauma happens. More recently, data um, using these same polymorphisms have shown in Harir's lab at Duke increased amygdala activation with fearful faces, and Nagarfani at Emory showing differential hippocampal activation as a function of FKBP5. Another example uh, looking at differential genetic risk is the um, ABCYAP1. So that's a big mouthful, but it stands for adenylate cyclase activating peptide, and shorthand is PACAP receptor. What's cool about the PACAP receptor, this really a, a, a relatively newly understood pathway, very much involved in stress response. It's been shown in many animal studies involved in fear and stress response. In fact, homologs of the PACAP receptor have now been shown to be involved in fear in humans, rats, mice, and even fruit flies. So it seems to be a very highly conserved pathway. A particularly interesting example with this is it seems to interact with sex. So we talked about females being at about a two to one increased risk for PTSD than males. Well, interestingly, a polymorphism in the PACAP receptor in females only is associated with much more PTSD symptoms compared to another P version of the gene, but in males it is not. And again, in females, this risk version of the gene is associated with much more amygdala activation to fearful faces. And what we now think is that this version of the gene is associated in an estrogen response element that's involved in regulating the gene. So it may be a particular molecular pathway where sex hormones, estrogen, are interacting with the stress pathway to lead to, in certain at-risk vulnerable people, to be more likely to have an overreactive amygdala fear stress response um, at the time of a severe trauma. So those are a couple of examples where um, we've had, for a variety of reasons, either candidate studies based on known biology or limited gene studies based on looking at the intersection of um, animal studies of, of genetics and human studies of genetics, where the field, um, all of the medical fields, and certainly psychiatry, are trying to go in terms of identifying unknown pathways is using large-scale genetics um, to really mine the entire genome and say, how can we identify pathways we don't yet know about? And genome-wide association studies are the um, really holy grail for how to do that. this currently. Um, on the bottom right is um, the poster child for this direct this effect in psychiatry right now, which is the Psychiatric Genomic Consortium. With schizophrenia has been the lead of it, and this has been led by many, many people with Patrick Sullivan as, as the um, really the person in charge of organizing the process, um, where many hundreds of investigators have put their samples together to be able to get over 100,000 total samples with over 50,000 cases of schizophrenia. And only when they had that sort of power were they then able to find very significant effects. So this is an inverse log. So, so p-value of 0.001 would be 3, 6 would be 10 to the minus 6, et cetera. So to have a correction for looking at a million different polymorphisms across the genome, one needs to have this level of significance. And only when you get around 50,000 cases are you able to see this many hits associated with the gene. And this is leading to a whole new molecular genetic biology of schizophrenia. And interestingly, a lot of these pathways are in synapses and other parts of um, neurons and cells where it's starting to make sense for how they may be involved in structure. PTSD is certainly far a lot further behind schizophrenia in this, but um, we've created the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium PTSD Initiative. Anybody who has PTSD genetic samples that might be interested in collaborating, please let us know. But as a group, um, even though there's several PTSD studies that have been done so far, they've all been very um, had had very relatively small ends, less than a thousand cases per study. 
And we hope by next year from the PTSD consortium to have closer to 50 or 60,000 total cases. So we're what our samples total with about 20,000 cases. So we're, we're on our way. And what we hope as a field is that once we can start to catch up from a genetics perspective on PT risk for PTSD, we have a much more well understood neural circuitry of fear and neural circuitry of PTSD to lay this understanding of biology and genetics on so that we may be able to move relatively rapidly once that begins. So I talked about pre-existing sensitivity and differential risk for um, his, as a function of child abuse, as a function of um, gender, as a function of genetics. Um, and we hope that these will really help us to understand many more biolog biological pathways leading to new treatments and interventions. I want to shift gears now and talk about once someone already has PTSD, how does the neurobiology of um, risk and resilience of fear and recovery specifically lead us to new ideas about how to treat PTSD. And this comes to, back to this idea of extinction. And we can really think of extinction as learning to inhibit fears or overcoming our fears. And Pavlov, um, over 100 years ago, defined extinction as the gradual reduction of a condition response in the absence of a condition stimulus. So in a mouse model, we'll, we'll take a tone and we'll pair it with the shock so the mouse is afraid of tones. And then he'll get the tone over and over again, and over time he won't be afraid. Um, and what that looks like is this. If the condition response is a freezing response or a startle response, the mouse will learn to be afraid so that now he's afraid of the tone, even though the tone previously was neutral. It wasn't a big deal. Now if, he plays, if we play the tone over and over again, in the absence of any shocks, um, sorry, I messed up. So we're in, in, in the acquisition side, they're getting shock tone pairing, so they're learning to be afraid of the tone. Then we're stopped playing the shocks. And now we play the tone alone, and the animal decreases their fear. We can think of, essentially, this is modeling the trauma exposure where the person has a previously neutral cue, the place where they were attacked, the street where they were driving on when they had the motor vehicle accident, et cetera. Those previously neutral places are now have acquired this trauma fear memory. With exposure therapy, we're talking about this experience over and over again. So that over time, they can talk about it. It decreases its valence in their memory system, and they're not afraid of it. When we bring the animal or the person back weeks later and test them, those who have extinguished the fear show less fear response to the cues than those who haven't. OK, so that's the idea behind extinction, and again, the, behind the idea of exposure-based psychotherapy. What is the biology behind this? There's a number of different things, but the first story I'll tell you is briefly about the biology of learning and memory. So one of the most well understood um, proteins for, under, for learning and memory is the NMDA receptor. And the NMDA receptor binds glutamate, which is one of the main transmitters in neurons. And when one neuron activates another one that has NMDA receptors, it will, glutamate will bind. Well, again, I told you that one of the roles of the amygdala is to combine the information from the sensory inf information with the pain information. And that leads to structural change so that now in the future, the, the tone information alone will activate it. That's partly because NMDA receptors act as AND gates. When the cell is both activated because another part of the cell is activated and this particular synapse gets glutamate, together you get voltage-gated, ion-gated sensitivity, and calcium comes through and activates synaptic plaque. Well, NMDA receptors are, are chock full in the amygdala as shown over here, um, and it's one of the most important mechanisms of both fear learning and extinguishing of fear. Well, there's one way, there's a number of ways of modulating it, but one way of partially modulating it is through a drug called decycloserine. And what's interest, important here is that it partially modulates this, making the receptor work better. So what about all this? Well, the reason this is important is Mike Davis's lab had shown 20 years ago that learning to inhibit fear is an active process. You're not forgetting the fear, rather you're learning to inhibit it, um, and this requires NMDA receptors. So these are what the data look like. They took a bunch of rats, they trained them to be afraid, they tested how afraid they were, in this case using startle. The red bars are the rats that are afraid. They then, um, they were afraid of lights because they received um, lights and shocks together, and then they brought them back into the extinction. And when they gave them 60 lights in the absence of any shock, and then they tested them again, and the green bars show they weren't afraid anymore. So they had learned to inhibit the fear, that they'd extinguish the fear memory. But if they extinguish the fear memory in the presence of a drug that blocks an MDA, and they test them again without any drug, they're just as afraid as they ever were. The take-home message is you learn to inhibit fear as a function of plasticity receptors in the brain. And if you block that plasticity, you block fear. So about a decade later, in Mike's lab, we asked, could we do the opposite? Could we take an animal that was afraid, do a partial extinction so they still had room to improve, 
and then enhance NMDA function using this decycloserine and enhancer, and then test them. And sure enough, they, these rats now show less fear. So we made the extinction learning process work better by combining a cognitive enhancer with the cognitive plasticity event of extinction of fear. So what? What was the reason we used decycloserine was because it had been shown to be effective in tuberculosis in the 1960s, and it was actually one of the first-line tuberculosis agents for a number of years for entirely different reasons. The, the take-home is that the serine moiety um, was used for bacteria to make new proteins, and the cyclic moiety of serine would muck up bacteria translational machinery. So at a much higher dose, about 2,000 milligrams a day, decycloserine was used as an antibiotic, but at about 50 milligrams a day, it could enhance cognitive functioning. So we wanted to know with Barbara Rothbaum and Mike Davis, could we enhance extinction of fear in humans the same way we did in a rat? And Barbara was one of the leaders of virtual reality therapy, and the wonderful thing about virtual reality exposure therapy is that we can study therapy a lot easier. Everybody can get the same assessment before, the same assessment after, and can get the same exposure during therapy. And in this case, we did fear of heights. People went up to 19 floors in this virtual fear of heights. They walked out on these um, catwalks. They held this bar and looked down at the lobby below. Now, um, my teenagers think this looks like a really bad video game. <laughs> and um, they're, they're partially right, and it was the graphics were made in the late, late 90s, and they're kind of primitive. What's cool about that is I showed you in the beginning and had the anecdote of my wife who's afraid of sticks. And that's because the, the amygdala, if you're afraid of heights, senses this, and this very primitive information activates the fear system as if you're really um, in a height situation. If you're not afraid of heights, it feels like a bad video game, and that's about it. Okay, so everybody in this study, normally they had shown it'd take six or eight sessions, people would go up, um, and they would become much less afraid if they did six or eight full sessions of exposure. So we did what we did in rats with a partial exposure, and they received decycloserine or placebo, brought them back a month later, three months later, and found that those who had the active component showed faster and more effective ex decrease in fear compared to those with placebo if they'd only had two or three sessions of exposure. We could do the same thing in humans that we did in rats. We could make extinction work better and faster by enhancing NMDA functioning. So since that time, there's been about eight to ten um, studies um, looking at exposure-based psychotherapy across a number of fear-related disorders. Um, showing a positive effects with decycloserine. In social anxiety, it's been shown um, to enhance the rate of exposure therapy. In post-traumatic stress disorder, a couple positive studies now, though there's also a couple negative studies, and with panic disorder and with OCD as well. And across all of these, what's where we are currently is um, that it seems to work um, in the majority of published studies, but there are several that it has not worked in, and part of those we think may have to do with dosing, it may have to do with timing, um, a number of other things that we still don't fully understand. One of the most interesting findings in, in Adam Guastella's paper was that they found that when they did a retrospective analysis, the people who made good progress with in-session exposure, those people were more likely to have gains with decycloserine by the next um, session. Whereas if they did not make progress, they did not have gains. And so that fits with the animal literature by Rick Richardson and others that decycloserine enhances the consolidation of the emotional memory event. So if there's not positive memory, if there's not advancement, then um, one does not have the same, um, you do not see as much advancement in the consolidation. So what this, we don't think this necessarily by any means is the be all and end all of this approach, but it's really exciting to us as an example of a bench to bedside rationally designed approach that's starting to lead to a whole new way of thinking about using cognitive enhancers in a targeted specific way to enhance specific components of therapeutic function. So I'd like to go for the last part then to talk about um, really sort of the next generation based on our understanding of the neurobiology of amygdala function and of extinction function. And again, we talked about the idea of the medial prefrontal cortex activating and inhibiting the amygdala in different ways. Um, and to, by understanding the different cell circuits involved in amygdala regulation, we may be able to make much more progress. And one very interesting study by Andreas Luthi in Switzerland suggested that the amygdala is actually made up, we knew it was made up of many different cell types, but he's recording from the basolateral amygdala with electrophysiological recording show that they're actually very different functional cell types. And they found that there was one type of cell that responded to fear conditioning and another type of cell that responded to extinction. So that it, once the animals were afraid, it, they would have had these fear on cells. If they extinguished the memory, the fear on cells would no longer fire, and what they called the fear off cells would start to fire. 
and one of the questions in the field is are, are these specific cells differentially um, developed cells that have different molecular characteristics and one set of new studies suggests that there there may be a specific fear off population that has particular molecular markers and this particular cell population makes up about one third of the total pyramidal or excitatory population within the amygdala um, and this just shows those neurons fluorescing within the basolateral amygdala, but not within the lateral or the central. Using a technique called optogenetics, um, developed by Carl Beitharoff, and an extraordinarily exciting idea where one can um, combine laser activation of these particular cells and then see cell firing. Um, Tig Rainey was able to group was able to show with David Ehrlich um, and Aaron Jasnow that activating these basolateral neurons, these proposed fear off neurons prevented um, the, the cellular activation from of input from the lateral to the central the hardwired fear output pathway so that only when these cells were turned on did the pathway get blocked so Aaron went on to do behavior and showed if he gave if he activated those cells in the amygdala at the time of the shock the animals learned to fear fine but they then did not express fear so it looked like it inhibited the fear expression and in contrast, if you trained animals to be afraid first and then tested extinction while activating these fear off neurons um, shown here, they then had a very profound extinction retention. They showed much less fear. So whether they were doing fear training or fear extinction, this population of specific subpopulation of cells seemed to be involved in turning off the fear pathway. Um, one of the things we know in our soldiers is that traumatic brain injury is highly associated with PTSD, and one of the predictions is that either through the cortical process or subcortical process, it somehow changes the brain in a way that makes them more sensitive to fear or more have a harder time extinguishing fear. And Scott Help and Tony Reiner at um, University of Tennessee had a very interesting finding in which first they showed that if they did a traumatic brain, a closed head traumatic brain injury model in mice, these animals stayed afraid for longer. So this shows their level of fear. They take, the red bar shows that it takes them much longer to extinguish fear. And they then looked at these um, particular Psi-1 off neurons, and they found after, um, after the head injury, there were fewer of these within the amygdala, suggesting that if, if these cells turn out to continue to be, um, suggest that they are the fear off neurons, that something about the traumatic brain injury may make them more sensitive to either not expressing these genes anymore or actually dying in a way that decreases the ability to extinguish. So I've given a couple different examples now of how from a cognitive enhancer perspective we can enhance extinction and how um, our understanding specific neural circuits that inhibit fear memory formation could be used to target new therapies and new drugs that target that cell population to enhance extinction. And I'll end with how can we prevent fear memory formation. So again, here's another schematic of the amygdala, an idea that there's many different cell populations within the basolateral projecting to the central. But in the end, the central medial um, nucleus of the amygdala is the main area that's involved in activating this fear response. So um, we've done a number of studies, and others have as well, looking at different genes that are expressed in this area during fear memory formation. And I want to tell one story about a gene called tachykinin 2. And this gene encodes the neurokinin B pathway. And what's particularly cool about it is that it's expressed explicitly within the centromedial amygdala. So we talk focus just on this subunit. It's expressed only there and is in a different subset of neurons than PKC delta, which is another fear off population, or enkephalin, which is a fear off population. So one, it was one of the first, is we think the first gene showing expressed specifically in a subpopulation of the amygdala that activates the fear process. And second, what was interesting about it is there was a known drug that was could be repurposed called a sanitant that blocks the receptor for TAC2. And Raoul hypothesized that if TAC2, as we identified, is involved in fear consolidation, if we block TAC2, we should be able to block fear consolidation or block fear memory formation. So we trained animals and gave the drug 30 minutes before fear conditioning or 10 minutes, 1 hour, 4 hours, or 24 hours after fear conditioning. And then he tested them with no drug on board 24 hours later. And the, in all of the cases except for four hours after, he found that the drug was associated with decreased fear consolidation. He went on to show that if you gave this specifically within the amygdala, they also showed decreased fear. So if you train the animals to be afraid, gave the drug targeted to the central amygdala, and then tested them off of the drug 24 hours later, the animals showed much less fear. And again, what this suggests is that this new molecular pathway associated with fear consolidation can be targeted with already available 
safe human drugs like a sanopan, um, and that that might be a target that we could give in the emergency room after somebody's had a trauma, and it may prevent the fear memory formation, but not affect other kinds of memory like con um, contextual memory and declarative memory. Another path with a similar idea and gene that was found but has the opposite effect is opioid receptor like one, one of the members of the opiate family, um, like mu opioid, kappa opioid, delta opioid, morphine receptors, et cetera. But OPR01 is a somewhat understudied pathway. Um, what was interesting about OPR01 is that, one, again, it's expressed highly within the amygdala. And, um, that our data suggests that activating it would inhibit fear memory formation. Sean Brothers and colleagues at Scripps Institute um, had a drug, SR8993, that was a particular agonist activating the OPR01 drug. So Raul tried it with the hypothesis that it might inhibit fear memory consolidation like the TAC2 drug. First he showed that if he gave it before shocking the animals, it had no effect. So it wasn't having its effect through any sort of pain modulation. So even though it's in the opiate family, we think it's specifically modulating emotional memory formation, but not pain regulation. It didn't affect fear acquisition, but when we tested them afterwards, they showed less fear. If you train the animals to be afraid, like a trauma, and then gave the drug, tested them later, they still showed less fear. And if you gave it specifically in the amygdala, they showed less fear. So again, all consistent with the idea that it brought consolidation of fear memory. He went on with Jenny Stevens and others in the Grady Trauma Project to show that um, in humans, a polymorphism in this gene was associated with differential PTSD, and the polymorphism in the gene was associated with different connectivity with the amygdala in human brains with the insula, an area particularly involved in interoceptive pain cues and involved in the emotional components of pain. So together, we think it's a very interesting pathway that may be involved both in fear consolidation and the emotional pain um, pathways involved in fear memory formation. So what these two data sets suggest is that after trauma exposure, there's a number of biological pathways, um, including adrenergic pathways um, and, of course, fear pathways, and that both activating the nociceptin or OPR01 pathway as well as blocking the TAC2 pathways are two potentially novel ways based on neural modulation of amygdala function to block fear from developing in the first place. So I've gone over um, pathways involved in understanding risk involved in genetics, developmental trauma, and gender. New ideas based on neuroscience for how we can enhance recovery by targeting the learning and memory processes that involve extinction, um, that enhance extinction that underlies exposure-based psychotherapy. And by understanding molecular genetic approaches involved in amygdala formation of fear, new pathways that might lead to inhibition of fear memory formation. And together, we hope that these sort of approaches can lead to a neurobiologically and genetically informed um, new sets of interventions and treatments to both target the prevention of PTSD as well as its intervention. The work that I've talked about has been done in collaboration with a whole host of colleagues, including genetic colleagues, Elizabeth Bender, and many geneticists at um, Emory, many molecular biologists and, and mouse molecular biologists at Emory, as well as a large and wonderful team at the Grady Trauma Project. And the um, work we've done was, many of the initial work was funded by the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, and more recently through HHMI and NIMH. Thank you all very much for your attention. Jeff, back to you. Thank you, Carrie. Um, what an outstanding presentation on a lot of very complicated science, but um, certainly um, stated in a way that uh, people could understand a, a lot of these complicated ideas. Um, and to me, one of the take-home messages is the important relationship between very basic scientific findings and then how that can translate into actual treatment. Um, and I think Absolutely. That's what we're exciting about it. Yeah. Right, and I think yeah. part, you know, I think PTSD is certainly an enormously problem, you know, difficult disease and morbid disease, and there are many, many reasons that for itself we need to make progress. But from a purely scientific perspective, I think PTSD is among the most tractable of psychiatric disorders. And so for that as well, I think for those of us interested in understanding and making progress in the biology of psychiatric disorders, it also provides a particularly useful area. Yes, yes. Uh, one, one question that a number of people have asked relates to um, right now, before some of these newer ideas are ready for prime time, what should a person do if they've returned 
back from service in the military or if they've experienced a traumatic event here at home, what should a person do? Yeah, absolutely. Terrific question. So um, is talk about it. Um, one of the most important things, certainly we want to understand how PTSD develops more. We want to understand these, these mechanisms. But it also is quite treatable with with medications. Certainly, antidepressants are where we start. Those can be modu those can be augmented with a number of approaches, um, from mood stabilizers uh, to others. Um, understanding, you know, having good um, good assessment to see is it, you know, is it pure PTSD? Is it PTSD comorbid with depression or bipolar? These can have different treatment implications, but they're good medications. But again, as more so than many other disorders, because we know where it starts, we also have real grist for the mill to work with in therapy. And there are a number of really good therapies. Again, the one that is most well um, you know, validated is, is exposure therapy. But there's a lot of good ones. And I th so I think the most important thing is to seek, seek treatment. And if you don't, aren't finding success with the first treatment provider, keep looking. Um, there's a number of, of good um, websites available. NIMH has good websites. Um, there's um, VA-based websites. There's a lot of information that's becoming increasingly available. And the VA, um, you know, for all of um, the various media, the VA has one of the most cutting-edge and appropriate treatment approaches to PTSD, um, you know, if you find the right people in the right places. So there are a lot of good treatments about it. And talking about it's really important. I think people over and over again think, I don't want to talk about my trauma. It'll make it worse. But in fact, that's not the case. It makes it better. I, I think often people end up just suffering in silence, not seeking help or assistance. Um, exactly. So I, think so, I think, absolutely. so I think one of the most common things that people do, and it, it seems very simple when you hear about it, but it's true, is that they think, I'm, 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 you know, thinking about this or talking about this makes me uncomfortable. Therefore, I'm going to not talk about it. But then I don't like really being around people because that may be trigger. So I'm going to stay by myself. You know, it makes me feel a little bit better if I have a beer or two or if I smoke a joint. That all makes me feel better. Well, all of those things work for a second, but it very quickly can get into a cycle of comorbidity, into a cycle of avoidance. And even without substance abuse issues, um, the idea of so, – so a great anecdote is um, the idea that avoidance by itself is reinforcing. So if you train a, a dog, for example, to be afraid of a square, um, you know, he gets shocked once or twice on a square. If he can jump over that square, he will jump over it forever, hundreds of times. Because every time he jumps over it and he doesn't get shocked, um, his amygdala says, see, I told you, if you, if you jumped over it, you didn't get shocked. <laughs> and the same thing mm -hmm. happens with, with, with avoidance. We avoid things. The bad thing doesn't happen. Therefore, that reinforces the idea that avoidance was a good cue, except that avoidance leads to many, many sequelae and other dysfunctions. And so we, this is trauma ex is one thing that if we talk about it and talk about it with a person who can be empathic and, listen, and a good listener, um, you know, certainly a therapist, but I think a lot of, we think, natural recovery um, is through people exposing themselves in their own natural way through talking about it with friends and family, through not avoiding, all of those sorts of things. The, one of the things that you brought up is the important issue of comorbid substance abuse and substance misuse. Could you say a little bit more about that issue in the context of post-traumatic stress? Yeah, I mean, it's a very important and very interesting area. First of all, it's very common. Um, so whether it's civilian trauma or whether it's military trauma, um, substance use, again, people start often from a perspective of self-medication. If I have a couple beers, I'll feel better. If I smoke a joint, I'll feel better. But it can very quickly, again, um, steamroll into you know being an avoidance mechanism that has a lot of other dysfunctions associated with it. From a... Um, from a, a neuroscience perspective, it's very interesting because many of the same areas that I talked about, the amygdala, the hippocampus, the prefrontal cortex, are many of the same areas that we talk about being involved in addiction and in terms of ability to control cravings and control responding. And so that we think when you have stress, the amygdala actually activates craving systems and can be a, very much of a activator of um, of addiction responses, so people who've been, um, you know, in recovery for a long time after a trauma are at higher risk for relapse. So often they need to be treated together. Um, that treating the addiction alone or treating the trauma alone is often not enough, and doing them together can provide a lot more chances of success.
Right, an important point. You have to treat the whole person, not just one part or the other, but the whole person. Right. Yeah. The, you, you spoke about the, the importance of childhood trauma as a potential risk factor. And um, one question is, if somebody has experienced childhood trauma, even if they don't have post-traumatic stress, should they seek some sort of treatment so as to avoid the, that increased risk factor of post-traumatic stress down the road? Yeah. It's a great question for which I don't know if there's much data, you know. Um, I guess it would come down to are they experiencing this, you know, problems with functioning now. You know, if they're very happy, they have great relationships, they're happy with their work, um, then perhaps they've recovered in a way they don't, you know, not everybody needs treatment. You know, some people have ways in which naturally, perhaps through other components of their development, other components of their life, that hasn't been as much of an issue. But often people find that even if they don't have fully full-blown PTSD or full-blown depression, they may not be functioning in a way they want. They may have difficulty with relationships. They may have difficulty holding relationships. They may have difficulty with their parents or their kids or their work. And, some, and therapy can often be a really good place to understand how the, those sort of how that web ha, is related or not to childhood trauma, and in many times it is, and understanding that childhood trauma and talking about it can often help free the person from living in the past and be able to live more in the present. The um, one final question relates to some of the new treatments about um, fear, memory, consolidation. We, does that kind of treatment take away the memory of the event, or does it just take away or decrease that response to the memory of the event? Yeah, thanks for a terrific question. So I think I think there's often, you know, people go to, you know, raise the question, well, is it ethical to be um, manipulating someone's memory? And it's, a, you know, it's obviously an important and a very, very important question. But I think um, our new understanding of parallel memory systems makes the question, um, Ha makes one ha makes us have to look at it in a very different way, and that is that we have multiple different memory systems as we go through the world that are all acting in parallel. So, example, um, we learn how to ride a bike, we learn how to type, we have these motor memory systems um, that are acting pretty much in parallel and distinct from our declarative memory systems, where we parked our car, um, what is two plus two, what are facts, which are acting in independent of our emotional memory systems. And um, again, at a simplistic level, the amygdala is involved in emotional memory systems, and the hippocampal and hippocampus and prefrontal cortex are more in the declarative memory systems. And so, the goal of these treatments is to decrease the emotional strength of that memory, so that the declarative memory would ideally not change at all. One would still know that this bad thing happened, that I was attacked, that I was in this car accident, but it would. It would change someone who goes from a dysfunctional, over-responding PTSD memory to one who just has a bad memory, but one can still go on with one their with their life in a normal recovery way. Good, e excellent explanation, because that's often a question people ask, and it's important for people to know we're not washing away or trying to wash away the memory of the event, but really those negative effects that that memory has on the person. Actually, improve the emotional regulation of that memory and process. Right. Um, Kerry, I want to thank you so much, not only for a great presentation, but also for all the work that offers tremendous hope to people um, that there are, that while there are good treatments now, there will be even better treatments in the not too distant future. So thank you for doing that. Thank you, Jeffrey, also and thank you the foundation you're, for being just terrific. You're, you're, you're welcome. I also want to thank our t attendees today for joining us in this conversation. All the research we fund is made possible through private donations. So if you'd like to make a gift, please visit bbo.org or call 800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion of this presentation or would like to share it with a family member or friend, please visit the webinar page at our website. And I hope you'll join us again next month when we'll be joined by Dr. Wade Berrettini, the Carl E. Rickles Professor of Psychiatry and Director of the Center for Neurobiology and Behavior 
at the University of Pennsylvania Perelman School of Medicine. He will present a webinar entitled Novel Findings in Brain DNA for Psychiatric Disorders. That will take place on Tuesday, February 10th at 2 o'clock Eastern Time. Once again, thank you for joining us and have a nice day. Take care.